Thank you for joining us today and welcome to the free uh, physics talk uh, in honor of Heinz Pegger. My name, as you already know, Natalia Perkins. I'm a condensed matter theorist from the uh, University of Minnesota. And indeed, I was uh, a general member here for three years. The only not correct information that I have never been here in winter, I was actually twice. Uh, but it's not about me. Okay, so tonight we have a truly special guest, uh, a speaker for the public talk here in Aspen. Please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Professor Ali Izdani. And uh, now, uh, before we get into the heart of his talk with this very intriguing title, uh, let me share a little about uh, Professor Ali Izdani and his work. Uh, Professor Ali Izdani is a world-renowned physicist celebrated for his groundbreaking research in experimental uh, condensed matter physics. Uh, Ali was uh, born and raised in Tehran before moving uh, to the U U.S. and then he received his uh, bachelor degree in physics uh, with honors, with highest honors from UC Berkeley and his uh, PhD in physics uh, from Stanford University. And uh, today, uh, Professor Ali Yazdani is the James uh, McDonnell uh, Distinguished Professor in Physics at uh, Princeton University, where uh, he is also a co-director uh, of Princeton Quantum Initiative and the director of the Princeton Center for Complex Material. Uh, Ali has been uh, recognized uh, by several awards and honors, honors for his incredible work. Is a fellow of uh, American Physical Society, a member of American Academy of Art and Science. He's a member of the National Academy of Science. And in 2023, uh, the American Phys Physical Society awarded Ali with the highest award, the Oliver Buckley uh, Condensed Metaphysics Prize, which recognizes his outstanding contribution to experimental condensed uh, matter immense metaphysics. Okay, this is all very serious uh, things, and uh, he is indeed uh, deserve all these highest uh, grades. Let me say a little bit less serious uh, words about uh, what is he doing, about his work. Uh, I think we can think about uh, Professor Ali Izdani as like quantum magician, yeah. uh, turning the seemingly impossible into uh, scientifically plausible things. If we had a door, better hundred and maybe thousand, uh, for each time Professor Ali Izdani discovered something new, perhaps as Aspen Center of Physics uh, would not need more money for the buildings and centers and for the programs that would be funded automatically. And so think about it. Uh, Professor Ali Izdani, uh, so what he's working on. So, um, uh, he focuses on a uh, fascinated world of quantum materials and electron interactions. And again, looking to the title of his uh, talk, you could say that he is a bit like Sherlock Holmes. Uh, but instead of solving crimes, uh, he is unraveling uh, some mysteries in, uh, of the universe uh, and uh, uh, electron life, so one electron at a time. And I have to admit that his passion for science is so contagious that even electrons are not staying around him. They kind of try to escape. <laughs> and finally, not to forget that uh, Ali is uh, just a great personality. He is not just about the work. And just to support that rumor, I has it that he loves skiing. Okay, so And I know this because I was here twice uh, during the winter season. And if you see someone uh, on the slopes uh, from uh, Aspen Mountains raising so intensely as he is doing his uh, research, then it might be him. And maybe he is uh, still searching for his perfect wave function. And so without uh, further ado, please give warm uh, Aspen a welcome to Professor Anis Dani. I think somebody once told me you should quit while you're ahead. Gotcha. Uh, thank you so much, Natalia, for that uh, uh, embarrassing uh, introduction. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been coming to Aspen for 27 years. And uh, yes, uh, I love skiing, but more than anything, this is a very special uh, institution for us uh, to come here and discuss with our colleagues. And of course, able to talk to you about what we are working on and share with you the excitement that we have about our science. A lot of wonderful physics gets done in the building next to us, which really uh, is a truly an amazing place to be. Today, I'm going to tell you about um, quantum mechanics, and I'm going to tell you about electrons. Um, and I'm going to hopefully start nice and easy uh, so that uh, I can carry you through this uh, one hour uh, telling you about uh, uh, not only the basics, uh, but also uh, sharing with you some of the questions at the frontier of this field. So I, I actually teach a class uh, where I try to teach quantum mechanics to uh, what we call future leaders at Princeton. It used to be physics for poets. They rebranded it to more students. <laughs> and uh, um, and I uh, first part of my talk is actually, some people actually pay money to hear this, so hopefully it would be useful to you as well. But uh, the idea is that, you know, quantum mechanics, uh, quantum theory, which I'll describe to you uh, slowly, actually one of the most successful scientific theories around. And it's, it's almost 100 years old. Next year is the 100th anniversary of quantum theory. And um, you may or may not realize that actually it has made our modern way of life possible. Uh, and I'm going to go through some of the ideas that have underlied building technologies that has made uh, our, you know, harm communicating with you uh, and communicating online uh, are possible. It's actually still poorly understood. Uh, and it's not like those things where we say, oh, physics don't, don't really understand quantum mechanics. It's actually, there are possibilities in quantum mechanics in which we can discover new phenomena that after 100 years, and which can have quite enormous impact, as I will try to share with you today. Actually, in one sentence, what is one of the special areas, which is actually what is the one of the focuses of this week's workshop here at Aspen, the quantum mechanics of many particles. It's not just one electron. We're going to start with one electron or one atom. It's actually, when you have many, many quantum particles, they create what we describe as quantum entangled states. I'll try to give you an example of what that is about. And I'm going to hopefully share with you that some of these things are bringing some new ideas uh, in order to advance not just basic science, but new technology. The plan for the talk is to actually start uh, from high school uh, and, and talk about, uh, you know, what are the basic understanding of atoms, molecules, if you like, and tell you a little bit about materials and how we use quantum mechanics to understand materials. And as Natalia explained, uh, what I specialize in is experimental physics, and my specialty they actually try to visualize electrons, not with an optical microscope, with a kind of microscope I'll describe to you, actually uses quantum phenomena itself, actually visualize individual problem, individual electrons. And what I want to share with you today is actually also some very recent work, this work that was just published, uh, which actually uh, breaks a, uh, a puzzle that's been around a search for like 90 years for a very special state of electrons when they are highly interacted with was good? Okay, good. So let's get started. So, you know, the, the premise is that uh, quantum mechanics got started with us uh, in, you know, in the early 20th century in uh, basically proposing that all matter is both particle and wave. And quantum properties can be described something called a wave function, which we, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about what is a wave function, except to say this wave function tell us where the electrons are, where they are living, and you know we can basically ask the question: What's you know what are they doing? Are they uh, are they moving or are they stuck? And this wave function will tell us, for example, uh, their, their all of their properties. When you solve the equations of quantum mechanics on a computer, you find some truly uh, weird behavior. Whereas you know sometimes the the uh, a, a quantum particle you behave like a particle, like that bright spot in this picture. Sometimes it can just sort of seem like you can break apart and create something that looks like a wave-like pattern as if water going through a, 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 a sort of a constriction. And 
you know, I'm going to show you images of this, how we image this actually using uh, our instrument. Now, um, let's uh, start very nice and easy. Uh, so, Electron was discovered before the turn of the 20th century in, in, in Cambridge, UK. It came before the discovery of quantum mechanics. It, we, we, uh, it was discovered that atoms basically have electrons attached to them. Then later, it was the idea that the atoms will have a core that's a positive charge, and the electrons are bound to the atom. So, how do we understand an electron? How do we understand an atom? Here we are, not far from the music tent, uh, and uh, think about a string instrument, okay? And think about waves on a string instrument. And on a string instrument, those of you who play it know that uh, basically you can think about a standing wave of uh, basically the string instrument vibrating. And there are something called harmonics. And these are ways in which the, uh, you can have different kinds of standing wave uh, on a violin string. And actually, this analogy is a very good way to start thinking about electrons. If I gave you a box, I ask you, I'm going to put this electron inside this box. You know, you say an electron is a, is a particle, is also a wave. Electron can explore the box. It can move around this box. Actually, when it, what it does when it moves around this box, just like you have vibration on a string, it just likes to live in a certain arrangements like you have on the, on the string, um, where you would have these type of patterns, these harmonics of, of motion of the string on a musical instrument. And this is the beginning of trying to understand, of course, there are equations in which pre predicts this behavior, but you can just start with this analogy of thinking about how you have an electron like a particle and a wave. Now, if I put an electron inside a box, it will have these standing waves. Those wiggly lines you see in the left side, it goes positive and negative. They're just like a string goes above and below where it would be uh, straight. And um, it, it, the, the premise of quantum mechanics is it tells us is that once you know these wiggly lines, if you just basically look at where the wiggly line is not zero, that tells you where the electron is living. Okay? So, uh, so far it's very simple, but actually... Analogy with the string, you also have a notion uh, which is these harmonics that we have on the string uh, are basically um, analogous to what you hear the word quantum. When we say we have uh, quantum mechanics, you know, we talk about energy levels being quantized, you can use this analogy of thinking about these harmonics of a string as being the kind of the frequencies in which the string can vibrate, in this case, relates to the energy at which the electrons can live in. They cannot live at any energy uh, if the box is small enough, uh, but they can live in this specific energy level. So um, we begin to see uh, how we might ask the question of where the, how, what the electrons are doing at the single electron level when we think about uh, these waves and if we can measure them, as I will show you in this talk, how we can do that. Now, uh, let's take a step further. Um, let's put the electron inside the atom. Uh, we remember it has a positive charge, which is the proton, or it has some uh, neutral particles there too. We're not going to talk about them. And uh, you can think about is attracting the electron uh, towards the nucleus, this positive charge of the proton. Again, it's just kind of like a particle in a box. You know, electrons like to be trapped near the proton. Okay, the box is not like the shape I showed you before. It has a different shape if you think about what the space electron likes to live in, but that's not really that important. But you can kind of understand an atom, uh, electrons in the atom, in kind of very much the same way. The nucleus attracts the electron. Electrons are living in a box. They like to put up these, stand, these waves. When you hear the word atomic orbitals, which you might have seen, heard in your high school chemistry, if you remember, these are just standing waves, just like you have on the string, in which it would tell you where the electron are, are, is living. Okay, the shapes can be somewhat complex, but the concept is actually uh, is kind of the same. And remember the quantized energy levels that uh, we talked about when we talk about quantized harmonics on a string, here it carries over also to the atom. You can think about electrons living at very specific energies, living in specific patterns, 
in these orbitals around the atom. Okay. And essentially, this concept carries you quite far. You think about each of these energy levels, it turns out that we're going to talk about what kind of particles electrons are in a moment. But it turns out that electrons also have something called a spin. When you put electrons into these levels, uh, you can put actually two spinning electrons in each of these levels. With that, guess what? You pretty much can understand periodic table. Okay? And uh, so we've gone from sort of zero, thinking about just strings and boxes, uh, and have come all the way to thinking about different elements, which has different protons, and the nucleus, and different number of electrons. Now, my field concerns with what, not what electrons are doing inside atoms, it concerns with what electrons do when you put them together to create a crystal. And to me, you know, you probably came to this talk and heard all these cosmologists talk about things in the universe, those wonderful things that they study. And to me, every crystal is like it's its own universe. Because the arrangement of atom in the crystal, as you will describe to you today, create rules for electrons to move inside the crystal as if you're living in a slightly different universe in each different crystal. So, you know, it, the diversity of phenomena you get in a crystal can be very different uh, from each other, as we'll describe today. So, um, you can think of this as a starting point of how to think about material. So, we bring atoms together. You know, there is, a, there is attraction between the atoms to make bonds. We'll talk about a chemical bond in a moment. We kind of arrange them in a crystal. Let's just think of them as just a chain of atoms. Of course, what electrons are going to do is they're going to maybe hop one atom to the other, they exchange places with one another, that's a possibility. They can do that. What happens? So we started with these atoms and uh, discrete levels of electrons in the atom, and basically we had uh, the, like a harmonics of the string. They have individual discrete energy levels. What happens if you put them inside crystal? Well, the electrons can hop around uh, between the different sites, you can spend some time, if you like, at each site. If you know roughly that time, if you wish, you can basically show that, oh, no longer electrons have a specific energy. Actually, when you put them in a crystal, they can have a range of energy. Those range of energy inherit, they start with the range of energies they started in an atom, but the, the kind of the range of energy is associated with how long it takes them to go from one, one atom to the next. Okay? It's something called the uncertainty principle you might have heard about, position and time, position and momentum and being kind of uncertain, Heisenberg. It turns out there is another uncertainty principle between energy and time. That actually gives you the width of the range of energies electrons can have in these things we call bands. Why am I telling you all this? With this, now you can understand essentially most of the materials around you. What do I mean? Well, you can understand what is a metal, something that conducts electricity. Because in a, in, a, in a metal, electrons move from one part to the other, can change their energy. So in order to change their energy in this diagram, they have to be some, you know, electrons fill up. You have so many electrons in the material. And if they, they fill up to the last energy level, and if they move around, they will change their energy. If there are no levels available, they can move. That gives you the metal. Also, you can understand what is an insulin. Because if you filled out all these levels and you basically end up with like a big, uh, what we call a gap to get to the next level, and that level is very far away. Basically, what I mean by far away is like, you know, in our scale of you have something in, in, in the real world, you have something that's at some temperature. If that energy range is sort of small or large compared to the temperature, electrons can't get across, so you have Self and insulin. You'll say, okay, that's pretty boring. Why are we talking about this? Well, this is the basis of almost all the technology that we have. Okay? All the technology we have in our, there is one thing more, a magnet, which I'll get to in a second, uh, which is a metal which conducts electricity between your transistors. I'll talk about the transistor in a moment. As your hard insulator, which is diamond. Okay? It doesn't conduct electricity at all. And you have yourself silicon which is conduct electricity not well. That's actually good because then you can try to control how electricity moves through silicon and that gives you basically transistor. 
Okay. So essentially, when you come thinking about technology, as we talk about transistors, of course, a lot of engineering goes into creating uh, basically the modern transistor, like uh, you have in your phones in your pocket, you have about 19 billion transistor. But the, phys the physics concept behind this is just understanding what the semiconductor does and perfecting that in the engineering fashion. That's good. Okay, so this is sort of the basis of a lot of what we do, but what else can, what else can electrons do? And what we are want to talk about today is what electrons do that's beyond just one electron moving around. What I just described to you is just a theory and ideas that just starts with a single electron and just piles electron into different levels and you get these different uh, behavior. The first example of electrons behaving collectively that was discovered, the phenomena called superconductivity. What is superconductivity? Well, it's superconductor, so what, what does that mean? You have a conductor like a piece of copper, it conducts electricity, it does it so well. If you cool it down, it, it, the electrons basically don't scatter from the vibration of the atoms in the crystal. It conducts a little bit better, a little bit better, as you go lower and lower in temperature. A superconductor does something very unusual, which is that at a given temperature, it suddenly has no electrical resistance. And this was discovered actually before quantum mechanics. And it took basically development of quantum mechanics, development of what I just described to you about what's the difference between a metal and insulator to begin to understand what is a superconductor. I'll tell you in a moment why you should care about superconductor. I think a lot of you have probably been inside the superconductor. You just didn't know it. Discuss that in a moment. Now, to understand the superconductor, we need to talk about something called entanglement. Okay? Electrons actually entangle with each other in a superconductor in ways that I'll describe in a moment. But the simplest you heard about the spooky dis uh, you know, action at the distance in terms of entanglement, you probably have heard of these words. And the, the simplest way to think about entanglement is just a chemical bond. Bring two atoms together, electron in one atom, like, and the other electron in the other atom, they want to be not just in the same, same atom, they want to be also in the other atom. So they create a entangled state in which we can be at both places at the same time. It dictates their properties, how a molecule behaves. Okay? So what does this have to do with a superconductor? So it turns out in a superconductor, I described to you electrons as being independent. It turns out in a superconductor, electrons actually sort of pair up and they find a partner. Once they find this partner, this fantastic zero resistance state emerges. Okay. So you say, well, how does that happen? All right. To, to describe to you how that happens, now I have to give you another important lesson in quantum mechanics, which is that in nature, there are actually, we believe there are two kinds of, only two kinds of particles. You got to get to another kind of particle toward the end of this talk, I hope. The first type is called fermions. Fermions are like very antisocial. Okay, they, they, it is, uh, if you think about the lev energy levels that I described to you, like in an atom, uh, they like to have their space, be in their own energy level. Okay, maybe they can have another partner, but they have to have something different, like they're spinning the opposite to each other to live in that state. Those are fermions. Electrons are fermions, and that's why you fill up those energy levels in a, ma in, a, in, a, in a metal, you have to fill them up one by one until you get to the last one, use up all your electrons. Now, the other kinds of particles are bosons. Bosons are a happy bunch. They're very social. What does that mean? It means that if you give them a bunch of energy levels, they don't care how many of them are in one energy level. They can all occupy even the same energy level. Okay? Why is this interesting? The reason it's interesting is that if you have a bunch of boson, as it was proposed by Bose in a letter in a communication with actually Einstein in the 1930s, proposed the idea that if you have a bunch of bosons, have a bucket, bosons are, can, you know, can be at different energy levels. If you cool it down at some critical temperature, the bosons decide, you know what? We can all go to the lowest energy and be happy all together. And this state of bosons make a perfect fluid. What is a perfect fluid? Water has viscosity. When you stare at water, 
you know, it goes around the circle for some time, and at some point, just stops because of its internal uh, fr uh, friction, this internal viscosity. This is a truly amazing fluid. You stir it, it just keeps going ever, okay? This is basically our superconductor. And we have electrons, and they decide to pair up the fermions as, as individual, but it turns out when you pair them together, they become a boson. This is sort of what we call a composite object. And once they do that, they can be happy to create this perfect fluid. Once you have this perfect fluid, it has no electrical resistance. Now, okay, that's a nice curiosity. What is it useful for? How many people here has, have had an MRI? Okay, me, I have like have maybe 100. <laughs> so if you had an MRI, you were sitting inside a superconducting coil. You know that little tube that they put you inside? It has a basically a, a bunch of wires, you know, looped up like a, what we call electromagnet. You pat, they, they, the technician came some months before you were there. They put a current inside the loop, which made the magnet, it makes a magnetic field. They put you in there. They put the, took the power supply away, and that magnetic field stays as long as they keep that uh, uh, basically machine cold uh, with with liquid helium in this case. So the the schematic that I have here, just one little loop. Just think about that perfect fluid. When you get it stirred here, if you inject current and make it a current of electrons, and these pairs move in a loop, it's just going to keep going forever and ever. And that's what gives you the magnetic field, which we use to basically do an experiment on your brain or your ACL, like in my case, to figure out what the hell happened to you on the, on the slopes. Now, there's another thing a superconductor is useful for, this little loop of current. It's the new technology that you may be reading about in the newspaper called quantum bits. Okay, it's trying to do quantum computing and computing with quantum mechanics. Okay, so what, what is that all about? So, um, remember the bits that you may think about inside our everyday uh, sort of technologies is either on or off, zero or one, okay? And um, now a quantum bit is one in which you can be in the superposition of zero, one. You don't have to be just zero, you can be one. You can be actually described as if you have some fraction of zero and fr some fraction of one described by an arrow on, on this sphere. How, did, how the hell do we make such a thing? Well, here comes superconductor. So if you heard about Google's superconducting effort, the basis of superconducting effort on Google is based on something like a, com uh, like a superconducting loop in which you have this super flowing current either flowing in one direction or in the other direction. That's the zero and the one. And if you can isolate this loop from the environment, in, in a way that it doesn't disturb the property of this loop, this super, this super flow, you can actually put it in a superposition of the two states. So right today, the, su the superconductors that uh, you know, are being, uh, the, the technology that's being used to create, for example, uh, this thing that you might have seen in the, in the newspaper, this is Google's noisy quantum computer. Why is it noisy is because when you make this delicate object that has, if you like, current flowing in one way or the other, the superposition of these two is so sensitive to its environment, if you have any kind of radiation coming from outside, even cosmic radiation, it, it, even if you have your wires not perfectly uh, uh, sort of arranged, you can disturb this quantum superposition. Is why building a quantum computer today is very hard. Because all the different technologies that we have, and I'll flash them in a moment, um, you know, rely on this creating this superposition, which in this case I described to you how it happens in the superposition. So we are, we are kind of in the stage of, I would say, pre-vacuum tubes in terms of uh, um, computing, classical computing. And... Um, you know, the, the size of the machines are kind of uh, 
not quite comparable, but the, the, the infrastructure required to do this is comparable. So we are trying to get out of this phase to the phase in which we will create technologies that are uh, really, really uh, um, can do the computing uh, that we want to do. So incidentally, quantum computing is not good for everything. It's not going to give you a better Microsoft Word computing. It's just built for certain class of problems in which this superposition do I describe allows you to do computation very, very fast. And you know, a lot of people are interested in it, including governments, uh, because you know you can use this to break a lot of codes, just like that uh, old machine did for the um, you know breaking codes uh, in a in a different way. So this is kind of comes the point in my talk where I try to describe to you everything that I have said to you about technology, even things that you read today about quantum information, quantum computing. The physicists, these are based on pretty much the things I described to you up to now. In some ways, they are, to us, quite old. We use concepts that are not as modern as things that are discussed here, for example, in Aspen. What do I mean by that? Besides these things, metal, insulator, semiconductor, simple superconductor, which I describe here, there are a lot of different amazing quantum states created by electrons interacting with one another, just like that superfluid I described, which could have amazing application if we could understand them better, not would allow us to understand quantum mechanics better uh, at a level that is undoubtedly uh, is going to have impact. Okay. So how do we go beyond this uh, electrons uh, in, in a simple metal? Now I'm gonna dis I describe to you this picture where electrons moving in a crystal where they jump from one atom to the next, and I describe to you how you get here from an atom. I describe to you how this range of energy of electrons, it turns out that when they have this wide range of energies, electrons actually very weakly interact with one another. That's what I mean. What I mean is that if I take these bands and I sort of squeeze them, I make a lot of electrons be at the same energy. Do I do that? Well, one possible way is, you know, I can make the time the electrons spend on every location, on every atom, very, very long. I move the atoms further from one another. It's a long time for electrons to go from one atom to the next. It turns out, throughout the last 35 years, this has given us a lot of different quantum phenomena, which I'll describe in the next 20 minutes, by just making a lot of electrons live in the same energy range. Technical term for this is flat band. You can go next week, come here and ask the physicists, what flat band system are you working on? There are a lot of people working on different kinds of flat band. <laughs> so uh, so what are, what are the, some of the consequences of this? You know, what are some of the examples? First one is actually the one that uh, gives us technology which I didn't describe, which is a magnet. Okay, so magnet, your refrigerated magnet, the magnet that is used to store information in MRAMs in the current technology, it relies actually on electrons interacting with one another. What does that mean? That when you force electrons to live in this narrow energy range, it turns out because they, they are interacting very strongly with one another, they try to all spin in the same direction. And this provides for you a, a the spinning electron is like provides a a, a, a sort of a magnetic field. When you have a macroscopic number of atoms, it actually gives you something in which you can, well, it's becoming smaller and smaller. You can store information by having even the magnet pointing up or down. It's like you would have a south and a north pole of, of, of any magnet. And you know, this has led to a lot of discoveries in what magnetism is, uh, just all comes from electrons interacting with one another. Now, um, Another example of doing this thing where you make electrons live in very narrow energy range was a surprising discovery that happened in the late 80s uh, uh, and early 90s, which was the class of materials. I told you about superconductors. I told you when you go get your MRI, you, your machine is cooled with liquid helium. The class of superconductors get superconduct relatively high temperatures. Temperatures, I mean liquid nitrogen. 
and some are uh, some even larger than that. Again, exhibit the same uh, uh, some of the same phenomena that I described to you. Of course, being able to get superconductivity without having to pay a lot to cool something down has a lot of advantages. These superconductors are are also quite. Uh, they can make very, very strong magnets. Uh, so this is a fun example of a sumo wrestler being levitated. But more importantly, these superconductors are being used in a lot of different applications. For example, power transmission. Actually, there are uh, there are actually pilot studies where you, if you want to transmit a lot of power to a certain region, which is very, for example, populated having a superconducting wire made out of these materials uh, with these electrons interacting very strongly with one another actually allows you to pass a lot of power with a lot of with a very little, a little less uh, less number of wires in terms of like normal wire like copper wires that we use if you have also been following the news there's been also a lot of uh, investment in new kind of ideas for fusion fusion is one of those things that people try to create by you know, power of the sun on the on the planet. Actually, that requires large magnetic fields, and uh, there are a number of companies that are actually using these uh, high temperature superconductors to create very strong magnets uh, used for this fusion uh, uh, application. All of this said, we have no idea. Well, we have some idea, but we don't actually understand these materials, how these superconductors work. We don't understand how they become superconducting, why they become superconducting at high, such high temperatures. If you understood that, maybe we can get, improve the situation even further. The reason we don't, we aren't able to understand it is because electrons in these materials, because there are many of them living in this very narrow energy range, they have basically very highly entangled states, which we simply cannot compute using our current theoretical and computing ability with our classical computer. In fact, one of the motivations building a quantum computer is actually being able to solve these problems, is being able, able to simulate these interaction of many electrons in order to understand problems as hard as this, and also related problems in biology and in chemistry. Okay. So now, in the next 15 minutes, I want to now switch gears and tell you about an example of electrons interacting very strongly with one another, and a, and a puzzle that's been around for a long time uh, about electrons interacting. I told you about metals, metals being liquid-like, moving. I told you about superconductors, electrons pairing up and creating this unusual state where they can flow without resistance. I want to tell you about the state that happens in, is, is proposed to happen in a lot of situations in which electrons actually make a kind of crystal. And this crystal is created by just electrons repelling one another. I don't mean a crystal made out of atoms. I mean a situation in which electrons kind of repel one another the way they arrange themselves to a lattice. As I'll show you, this is an example which has connections actually to many of these problems that we don't understand. Because this is a, a, a perhaps the oldest problem in which electrons interact with one another. Where did this problem come from? Well, this problem was actually considered uh, back in the 1930s uh, by someone who taught at Princeton, uh, Eugene Wigner. And he basically considered a situation where electrons repel one another and electrons can just make a crystal. And this was the first example of a, a collective state of electron in which they're interacting. And people have been looking for this for a very long time. Now, a little bit about Wigner. So actually, when he wrote this paper uh, at Princeton, he, he was a refugee. He, he came from, um, he was born in Hungary. He was taught at Berlin. And he basically escaped the Nazis, immigrated to the US. So then they, Princeton hired him, and then they fired him, mm -hmm. and then they realized they made a mistake. They rehired him. Actually, if you read his memoir, he has an interesting uh, proposal, about uh, idea about why he was sort of let go is because they hired two people at the same time. One was him, and the other one by the name of, by the name of John von Neumann. 
is a kind of a mo uh, you know sort of a father of uh, computing, father of many things, uh, he, and and his thinking was maybe they were more impressed with him than me. But uh, it's he's a if you read his memoir, he's such a modest man. He he had of course enormous contributions to physics. He got the Nobel Prize. But you might not know that you know uh, he was actually one of the key people who convinced Albert Einstein uh, to write a letter to uh, President Roosevelt about the possibility that we could build an atomic weapon and we should build one because the Nazis may build one. And he worked on the Manhattan Project. So here's an old problem that Wigner proposed. So how do we go about looking for this uh, crystal? Well, let me bring you also to the uh, to the sort of the area of some modern material and modern ways of imaging electrons in material. This is what I do for a living. I try to visualize what electrons are doing in all these mat complex materials that I told you about. And the instrument that I use is one which relies on a phenomena called quantum tunneling. It's not a microscope; is one that you look inside, you know, uh, like with uh, with light. This is a microscope in which we bring a very sharp tip, metallic tip, close to the sample surface, and you're not actually touching the surface. Okay. But there's something that happens quantum mechanically, which is an electron that is living inside, let's say, the tip, and actually quantum mechanically tunnel across to the other side into the sample. I'm going to solve, this is again, equations, a quantum mechanic equation that you can solve. You can launch an electron from this side, and it can come to the vacuum barrier. And of course, sometimes the electron will just turn around and not go anywhere. Actually, there's a finite probability that the electron can actually hop across this barrier and go to the other side. This probability is very sensitive to the distance between this sharp tip and the sample. In the um, late 80s, uh, basically, um, this, this instrument was built for the first time to, do, to try to sense this quantum mechanical current between the tip and the sample. And when you raster this, when they raster this uh, tip across the surface of a piece of silicon, they were able to, for the first time, image individual atoms. Because the, the probability of electron tunneling between the tip and the particular location depends on whether the atoms are there or not, or you're in between them. Okay. So I came into this field when uh, people were using this instrument uh, to do a, a, a lot of imaging of different atoms, different molecules, different structures of materials. It's a very powerful tool. The question for a few of us was, can we use this microscope to study these more interesting properties of electrons, these electron waves, these electrons being in a superconducting behavior, and so on. We're not looking, we're not interested on the atoms. We're actually interested in electrons moving around and their quantum mechanical behavior. Now, to do that, uh, we had to, you know, generation of instruments had to be developed, coming better and better and better. And, and you know, this is kind of one of our latest uh, instruments at Princeton. So big, I just have to show you a drawing of it because you know the picture doesn't show you that you know we have to isolate it from the environment inside a bunker, float the room with a very heavy floor in order to make the vibration so small because this tip to the sample is shaking, it just sort of blurs out the picture you would get with this instrument. Yeah. Let's start nice and simple. A simple metal. I told you about electrons in a simple metal. They just look like particles. Here's a piece of copper. You use its instrument to image a piece of copper. It has a few defects on its surface. You see the wave pattern, right? What this is, is basically electrons whizzing around, and they make the standing waves that I told you about. Okay? This is kind of like a um, sanity check, using this microscope to actually see quantum waves. Okay, these are actually electrons behaving like waves. Okay. And you can study this, but this is kind of a very sort of starting point of, of applying this technology because we want to study more complex quantum state. So let's go back. So, so my lab uses this instrument to study many different phenomena. So let's go back to Mr. Wigner and his crystal. Okay. 
So what we want to do is try to see whether we can use this instrument to visualize other electrons being in a wave, but actually electrons making a crystal. Okay. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use a new invention in materials, which is the isolation of a single carbon layer called graphene. And the reason we do that is that this material is structurally almost perfect. Carbon bond is so strong, it's very difficult to make an imperfection in this material. Of course, we can use, um, let me go back and I'll come forward. We can also use this instrument to image where the, uh, the atoms are, where the crystal structure of this, the lattice of carbon atoms are, makes this uh, image where you can see, you know, uh, everybody is sort of happily sitting and they're, so that you can find very, very large region of this material if you do the right procedure without any imperfection in the material. So what we learned from Mr. Wigner is that we want to get electrons to interact very strongly with one another to get to this state. So one idea is to uh, get just uh, very few electrons. So there is, you know, they just, it turns out that's one limit in which they interact very strongly with one another. Another idea is to actually apply a very large magnetic field. What does the magnetic field do? Electrons are charged, and when you apply a magnetic field, it makes them go around in circles. When they go around in circles, what happens is that basically the probability for them to move around from one place to another becomes smaller and smaller. Okay. Remember, we talk about squeezing the range of energy where the electrons live to make them interact strongly. This is what the magnetic field does for you. Apply a very large field, it makes the electrons who have live in a large range of energy, makes them live inside these very sharp, narrow regions of energy. So now we go and try to fill each one of these. Uh, so, so now we go try to look for what the electrons are doing. We're not interested in atoms, right? We want to look at slightly larger energy scale a larger uh, dimension space to look at, you know, when the electrons are moving around, what kind of behavior they have. Let me show you a little movie. So this is a movie of um, basically with this microscope, we try to add an electron into the sample, see where the electrons goes in or where does it not like to go in. Let's just run the movie. Okay, this is the beauty of experimental physics. Uh, you just look at the data and what I'm doing, what I'm going to do this movie is, so this is a 300 nanometer, a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. You're not looking at the scale of an atom, we're looking at a larger scale. A pretty small sp scale, it's a third of a micrometer, okay? And you see a kind of bunch of jumbled things, okay? You see there's a little number here, and this number tells you that we, we, we have a way in which we can use an electric field to basically control how many electrons we have put into this region of the sample. So you, you look at this image, and, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to now increase the density of electrons. This number is just going to keep rising, increasing slowly uh, with, uh, uh, with each frame. And you can sort of see that as we change the density of electrons, as we put more and more electrons, sort of a pattern emerges in this picture. Okay? Let me go to what the pattern is. So at the most ordered organization, you, you, you might have noticed in that movie, is that we have this arrangement of a hexagonal lattice to our observation. Okay. So what are we, what are we looking at? Okay. So zoom in. We have some, so what we have done in this experiment is we have this sheet, which is made out of a single thick carbon layer. We've added some electrons to it apply the field to make him interact very strongly. We just came and see where we can sense where the electrons are in the sample. We see that they, they, there is this periodic pattern of features in this, in this data. What it looks like is that you have a lattice made out of, okay, maybe there are electrons. It's, we we're going to confirm that in a second. So we have a lattice. And we can measure the lattice constant just like you can measure any kind of periodic structure uh, from these images. And then you can ask, uh, you know, is this a lattice made out of single electrons? It turns out that you, you can do this uh, as a 
And so here you control the density of electrons in those pictures. On this axis, you measure the distance, which is the lattice constant between what I call those, those balls in, in the picture. This seems to confirm for us that indeed what we have done is we have made a crystal made out of electrons that they are just repelling one another and they just arrange themselves in a hexagonal lattice. Now you look at this picture a little closer and you say, well, what, is, what determines the size of this feature? Is this a single electron? Well, you read the numbers from the experiment, this is 30 nanometers, okay? Electrons are very small. 30 nanometers is a very large number. It's a billionth of a meter or a nanometer, but Electron is much, much smaller than the nano. What are we looking at? It turns out that what you're looking at is basically uh, the quantum uncertainty of where this electron is. It's living inside this crystalline lattice, but it actually is there is an uncertainty of where it is. And it's actually it, this sort of region that we see in this instrument is actually telling you about this quantum uncertainty and this. The, the, the amazing thing about this lattice is that the quantum uncertainty is a very big fraction of the distance between the electrons. This is, makes it a very unusual lattice structure. This gives you an example of, of electrons uh, interacting very strongly and making a crystal when they, they should. And this crystal is just purely made out of repulsion between the electrons. And this particular uh, 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 crystal it's sort of the simplest example that you could make of electrons interacting. You might have noticed that I didn't plot any data in this little region in this plot. What happens there? Let's go back to the pictures. Mm. So I showed you this picture. I didn't show you what it does all the way. Actually, if you change these numbers just reflect how you're changing the density of electrons. You have you change it from some number to a very particular number, which is 0.333333. What happens is as if this crystal of electron has melted. And this melted crystal has made something which doesn't have any features in our experiment, like a, like a fluid. It turns out that this is a very special fluid. And it was discovered actually long ago, about 40 years ago, uh, in different experiments, not microscopy experiment like we are doing here. It was in discovered in experiments where you pass an electrical current to this two-dimensional gas of electrons under the same conditions. What are the conditions? Remember I told you that what the magnetic field does is it creates these narrow range of energies where electrons can live. It turns out that this there are some very magic, we call filling, of if you, if you fill this all the way, it behaves one way, but if you fill this a third of the way, it creates a certain kind of quantum fluid, kind of like a superfluid, that has properties which are macroscopically distinct from a metal. It actually, they show quantized behavior measured in, when you measure its electrical property. So we have this interacting soup of electrons, Electro, uh, interacting soup of electrons can make a crystal. If you just change the number of electrons interacting at some magic number of them per unit area, you have a magnetic field present. Electrons create a completely different state. Now the crystal, it looks like a melted crystal and it has some interesting properties. In the last few minutes, let me tell you what's interesting about this. Theoretically, what we believe happens, you make a fluid. It is very unusual. It's kind of like a superfluid. But what's unusual about this uh, particular uh, fluid is that no longer elect you cannot think about electrons as those balls that I described as sort of the basic, if you like, property of this liquid. Electrons are so entangled with one another, they make a new kind of liquid, which if you add energy to it to excite it, it creates citations that are not like electrons at all. They actually have action of a charge of an electron. Okay, so 
First, we have a superconductor, which carry resistance with you know, no resistance when you make the sun a superfluid. Here, we have a different kind of quantum state in which it has resistance. Actually, the constituent parts that are carrying electricity inside are not electrons anymore. Actually, fractions of an electron. So why am I telling you this? The reason is, at the beginning, I described to you that in nature there are two kinds of particles. Fermions, and they're bosons. We, we talked about the beauty of bosons. Bosons make us that superconductor, and so on. It turns out that how you distinguish these two set of particles is you have to think about, uh, you know, if, I, if uh, you and I are the same particle and if we change places, right, everything should stay the same, right? So how, well, how, there are two ways in which you can, everything can stay the same. We have a description in quantum mechanics. When we talk about these wave functions that we describe, in one case, the wave function can just be the same as it was before. If we are the same, we change places. In terms of fermions, when they change places, the, there is something happens to the, to the wave function where you get this uh, change of minus sign, which is not that important when you think about the overall properties, uh, when, you when, you think about, when you think about the probability where the particles are. This makes it very different between what fermions do and what bosons do. And this is essentially gives you this social antisocial behavior. It turns out that the particles that are living in this new quantum fluid that I described uh, uh, to you is actually something, there are particles that are kind of in between, are near fermions, near bosons. Okay? The reason we are interested in these particles is that they can, we can do things with them that are not possible with fermions and bosons. It turns out that one of the special things you can do with them, which is sort of counterintuitive, is that if you took one particle and took it around the other one, it kind of remembers how you did that. It remembers if you went one way or the other way. And if you think about uh, sort of in time, you, have ex you, you move these particles around one another inside this fluid, uh, they, you create something in terms of a quantum state, it kind of looks like you have braided timeline of these particles together. Okay. So what's so special about braiding? Well, if you want to undo it, there's only one particular way you have to do it, right? It's gone one way, you have to undo it in a specific way to undo the braiding. But what's special about this is you can try to encode information how you took these particles around one another. If you encode information in this particular way, it has what we call more protection because in order to undo it, you have to undo it only in a particular fashion. Part of the reason we are interested in these states, in these quantum states, is, is to try to create uh, the next level of quantum bits. So uh, the whole information technology on co based on quantum information is about how, to, how do you encode information in a quantum system. Remember the superconducting loop? You said the superconductor, you can have the current flow one way, you can have it flow the other way, and then you can encode information in these two states, configuration. Here, you can encode information in, in a completely new way which is uh, based on exchange of these particles and how they move around one another. In fact, uh, you know, this is not just something academic. Actually, even there is an industrial effort by Microsoft is trying to not in it, exactly what I'm talking about is related sort of ideas where they're trying to sort of use these particles uh, to create kind of quantum. Bit. All right. So I think what the message I want to leave you with um, I've already gone a few minutes over, is that, you know, we have ordinary metals, insulators, even ordinary superconductors, which we understand very well. And they give us our technology and amazing things today. But now we have a whole set of other stuff, this other quantum state that comes from the emergent property of many electrons talking with one another, the superconductor being one of them, this exotic fluid uh, being another one. And uh, I think that, uh, let me just skip this and go to the end because I've run out of time. Uh, and I want to just end by just saying, you know, this is one of the frontiers of 
quantum mechanics is trying to understand the emergent behavior of many particles uh, interacting with one another. And materials view very unusual, very amazing uh, opportunities because you can kind of write different rules about how you create states because of you know, periodic table is very large. And many, many kind of atoms you can put in a crystal, many kind of crystal structures we can make. And the possibilities to kind of look for these exotic state is kind of at this point looks like I have a long way to go to exhaust it. With that, I stop and take any questions. There's a guy here who's sitting in the back who actually did an experiment. Oh, thank you very much. So the 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 question was: Is the one third charge like a particle, or is it like a, sort of a wave? Like that was the question. Some sort of neutral wave function. Combination of electrons. So so this so. The question you're asking is kind of deeper than what you're maybe intending to. So let me back it up in a second and say, you can actually detect the, quant the fractional charge. There's a guy sitting in the back here who did one of the first experiments to know that the fractional charge is there. And then the question is whether if you have one, is this going to behave, you know, can, you, you can make it behave like a particle. You can certainly make it behave like a wave. So people, tr people are actually doing experiments now where they're trying to interfere these particles with one another. It's like those pictures I showed schematically. So yes, there, there would be both. This is, you can treat it like a particle and you can treat it like a wave, just like other exotic particles. Did you describe what happened the birth of quantum mechanics? Guess, you know, uh, oh, could I describe what happened 99 years ago? I wasn't around. Uh, and and uh, what led to the birth of quantum mechanics? So, you know, it's, uh, the birth of quantum mechanics took many stages. Of course, is sort of observations that didn't fit classical physics. It took a while for people to recognize that they needed new ideas uh, to describe them. So this is kind of some people would call maybe pre-quantum, but you know there were sort of two marks, which are when Schrödinger wrote an equation to try to describe behavior of electron, um, and then Dirac also write an equation to try to combine and quantum mechanics and relativistic physics. Heisenberg coming up with a completely different description of quantum mechanical particles. Those, are, those works all happened around the same time uh, in 25, 26, depends how you count, but uh, I think it's around that all of the papers appear around the same time. And you know, physics back then was a very small community. People talked to each other quite a lot and, uh, and I think that uh, it's a sequence of uh, different experimental observations and then you know, really amazing theoretical breakthroughs uh, trying to build something and then testing that with subsequent experiments. But it's the writing of those equations that we mark as sort of the birth of quantum mechanics. Um, probably a silly question, but... It's very complicated and interesting that for somebody who is not a physicist, can you give me a quick view of what the practical applications of all this are in our lives? So I, I think what I try to do is to describe to you think Keep the question. I'm oh, terrible. So for for a non specialist, please explain in short, quick, what is how is this gonna affect our lives? Why is this important to our lives? So I think the so let's take a little bit of a sort of view about 30, 40 years back. So essentially, all the technology that you use now are based on breakthroughs on trying to understand quantum behavior of materials with quantum mechanics, applying this theory to materials and using it to make transistors, magnet, magnetic devices, and so on. And we have reaped the benefit of that, of course, in spades. Yeah. yeah, this is uh, my iPhone. But what's gonna come? What's gonna come after? You know, we we are we are discovering new phenomena, which the application of some of which are, I try to sort of allude to some, some of which is still unexplored. So I think that you know, um, the way this field works is that 
people don't realize that whenever we make a discovery, actually five, 10 years from that, technology just emerges because it's the stuff you can hold in your hand and you can put it together in devices. And I think that this is kind of the important message uh, that applying quantum mechanics to understanding materials have just keep being, you know, paying. Of course, I didn't talk about light, which is another part of uh, quantum phenomena that is sort of paid in space. So you have uh, with ten electrons in it, you have one third charge. Gold crystal have n over three charge. Thank you. Does it have? Uh, you know, more, more electrons, you lose charge somehow? So the question is, you know, where does, what are these charge imbalance or unbalance come from? Like, where did, what happens to the, where the extra charge come from? And where does it, what does it mean for the overall charge of the material? So what happens is that when you tune your conditions to be in this kind of exotic fluid, you, you have a certain density of electrons. And see the electrons are fixed. Now, what you do is you say, imagine you add energy to the system, try to excite it. It turns out that what gets excited is not an electron that's sort of at a higher energy level. You can't do, you can't do that. There is a more subtle thing that happens, which is a, a fractional charge that emerges from, the, from many electrons uh, basically being excited. And then the, the, the distribution of this fractional charge depends on the sort of details of how, how, where you are relative to you know, destroying the state. It turns out that as you create more and more of these excitations, uh, you can basically collapse the state where everything disappears and you are back to single electron. The description I have of fractional charge is one of excitation of the system. Question? This is the last, last question. Last question. Yes. Okay. This, I'm not sure I can ask this question, but I'm going to try. Um, so this whole talk seems like it's kind of a celebration of all the applications of quantum mechanics that seem to just go on and on a hundred years later. But one of your bullet points said, but we really don't understand it. And I was reading David Ball recently, and he was lamenting that he's worried that we're not training enough people to work on the understanding side versus the application side. And I'm just wondering what you think of that. Well, to repeat the question is, uh, the talk seemed like I emphasize applications more. I think this is sort of my hope to try to connect to a larger audience. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and the second part of the question was lamenting that we are not training people to worry about fundamental. Me, David, David Ball. Yeah. So thank you for that, asking that question. I think the, um, to us who work in this field, there are a lot of questions that may seem very esoteric to the public, which are very deep about how many, many electrons or many part quantum mechanical particles gave. So for example, in this, this conference, we have people studying uh, sort of entangled states in which there's almost nothing to observe. There's nothing, uh, uh, nothing to see, but uh, to prove that state exists, have to do very subtle measurement of entanglement of electrons, which is, was one of the things we talked about. So no, we don't spend our time thinking always about applications, but I just want to emphasize that this history of, of these applications coming to things that you're familiar with really comes from understanding quantum mechanics. Yeah. And, and I think that what I'm trying to emphasize is that yeah. studying the exotic may not seem so exotic, you know, 20 years from now. Thank you. Last question.